let's introduce Kathleen, our speaker for today. Kathleen Halpern grew up on Long Island and she got her love for nature and its creatures from her dad, who even when he was working six days a week, he would take the family out on Sunday to walk in the woods, throw boats and look for turtles. He always had turtles, frogs, newt, fish and snakes as pets. And she lived in East North Port for 25 years and is converting the yard into a native habitat in her spare time. Her family enjoy watching nature from the window of their yard and she, her family especially love birds. She has been indoor seat sewing for the last 15 years and she has perfected her method. And today you are going to hear it from Kathleen herself on her process and how she did it. So you can do the same thing. So Kathleen. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm excited to share my passion for growing native plants from seed with you all. In this webinar, I will cover, I will cover researching the needs of the perennials that you want to grow, preparing the pots and seeds for germination, providing for the germination requirements of your seeds, caring for your seedlings as they grow, getting your plants ready for life outside, and how to plant your seedlings in your garden for the best success. About 15 years ago, I started growing plants from seed, first to save money, and now out of love for growing things. There's something so hopeful about putting seeds in a pot, taking care of their every need, and being rewarded with healthy plants, especially when those plants are native and are helping support local wildlife. Most of the perennials in my gardens were grown from seed. You don't need a lot of property to have an, an abundant native garden. My property is only one fifth of an acre and I have over 30 varieties of native perennials and shrubs. These are some of my gardens. I expand my gardens each year and further shrink my lawn. My soil is mostly clay, which can be challenging. My house faces south, so I get lots of sun in my front yard. In addition to these gardens, I've added three small native trees to provide a bit of shade and habitat. In my backyard, I have an old growth oak tree that shades most of the yard, as do the oak trees on my neighbor's properties. Over the years, I've added a pussy willow tree that I grew from a single branch and over 20 native shrubs in the hopes of attracting birds for nesting and berries, including red twig dogwood, elderberry, spicebush, arrowwood burnum, winterberry, sweet pepper bush, mountain laurel, and summer sweet. I also added a river birch to the back corner of my yard. So I fit a lot in that fifth of an acre. Here are my reasons that I love to grow native plants from seed. It's inexpensive. You can grow dozens of plants from a packet of seeds or a handful of collected seeds. It's a hopeful hobby. You can create new life in your garden. You can learn about and reproduce your favorite plants. Whatever plants you love, you can grow in, abund in abundance. It benefits local wildlife. You're providing for pollinators and your garden is a natural songbird feeder and nesting place. It contributes to genetic plant diversity. Plants grown from seed are much more genetically diverse and therefore more resilient than plants purchased. Your gardens are always growing and changing. You can expand and improve your garden in every season. In addition to adding native plants to my garden, I've been working to remove invasive plants such as Rose of Sharon, Wisteria, Multifloral Rose, and lots and lots of English Ivy. I also used to weed regularly, but about eight years ago, I started letting some plants go to flower so I could identify them. In the spaces I have cleared of invasives, I have some wonderful native plants that volunteer in my yard, like blue wood aster, white wood aster, evening primrose, and jewelweed. These are volunteer native perennials, not weeds. The wildlife in my yard love these natives too. You may wanna be a bit more patient with the weeding in your yard. Just be sure to identify the plants and remove them before they go to seed if you decide you don't want them to spread. 
Blue wood aster is one of my favorite volunteer native plants with its tiny pale blue flowers. The rabbits love to eat those flowers. And since it self seeds abundantly, it saves my other asters from being eaten. This year I had a large clump of blue wood aster that I was going to remove because it was crowding my viburnum bushes. Then I noticed all that was left were 12 inch twigs. Since blue wood aster is three feet tall, I thought I must have deer in my yard, but then my daughter spied a rabbit biting off the stem as high as he could reach and then eating the flowers when they fell to the ground. Wood aster is cool because the center of the flower starts out yellow and turns pink when the pollen is all gone. It's also fun to watch the sparrows on the white wood aster. They love the seeds. They fly up and try to balance on the skinny stems while pulling out the seeds before the stems give away and they fall to the ground. Well, they jump to the ground, <laughs> they can fly. These are some of my favorite native perennials that I've grown from seed, pictured here in my gardens. New York ironweed is one of the best native plants for attracting large butterflies and the songbirds love the seeds. New York ironweed, oh, sorry. The first time I saw wild bergamot, was at the Wild Center in the Adirondacks, and I was so inspired to branch out from coneflowers and black-eyed Susans to establish this beautiful native plant in my garden at home. Wild bergamot attracts bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and songbirds. I'm always looking for plants that bloom later in the season when most of the garden has gone to seed. Goldenrod with its fall blooms are invaluable to pollinators and migrating monarchs. I especially love blue stem goldenrod because of its delicate, beautiful flowers. I grow swamp milkweed because I love to see the monarch caterpillars munching on the leaves. I chose golden alexander because it blooms early in spring, the tiny flowers attract very small pollinators, and it's one of the only native plants that hosts black swallowtail butterflies. Smooth blue aster is not just beautiful, it's the first aster to bloom in late summer and is an excellent nectar source for butterflies and numerous bees. Here's some of the wildlife that show up in my garden. I have swamp milkweed and butterfly weed to host monarchs and many species of nectar plants for the adult butterflies, like these Maximilian sunflowers. This pearl crescent butterfly is on my blue stem goldenrod and this squash vine borer showed up on my swamp milkweed. My blunt mountain mint is always covered in all species of bees, wasps, and other pollinators. Since I've developed more natural landscaping, there are abundance of birds foraging, nesting, and visiting my yard with their families. These baby morning doves lived in my yard for weeks. Several years ago, I added little blue stem grass to my garden. Now we have so many species of skippers because it's a host plant for them. And this year, the song sparrows nested in the little blue stem. This was a really special year for wildlife in my yard. The first thing you need to do in order to grow natives from seed is to learn about the germination requirements of the plants you wanna grow. The more you know about the plants you wanna grow, the more success you'll have. Here are some of the best links I found to research the plants I wanna grow. Prairie Moon Nursery, The Wild Seed Project, and Grow It, Build It website and YouTube videos. Prairie Moon Nursery website is a great place to start learning. For every plant or seed that they sell, they have detailed information on germination and growing conditions. The germination code will cover pretreatment of seeds, including cold stratification, light requirements, soil temperature, you can search the site for the plant you're trying to grow. For example, butterfly weed has a germination code of C30, 30 days cold stratification. I'll cover this later. Most of the native seeds I germinate have these germination requirements. No pretreatment necessary, cold, moist stratification, 30, 60, or 90 days, or seeds are very small and need light for germination. Here are the germination codes for my favorite plants. New York ironweed, 60 days, cold stratification. Wild bergamot, no special treatment. Blue stem goldenrod, 60 days, cold stratification. And also it needs sunlight to germinate. Swamp milkweed, 30 days, cold stratification. 
Golden Alexander, 60 days, cold stratification, and smooth blue aster, no special treatment. Wild Seed Project website has excellent information on how to grow from seed. This article covers how to germinate, sowing seeds, and waiting for germination. They assume you're putting your pots outside, but I have better luck inside. You can try both. This article will tell you about putting the seeds outside. Grow It, Build It is another excellent website. They also have videos on YouTube with specific details on lots of native plants. You can search YouTube for the video you need. For example, Grow It, Build It, Wild Bergamot. These videos will cover what it is, why to grow it, how to grow it, how to save and germinate seed, and what wildlife it'll bring to your yard. My process came from these sources and trial and error. When I first started growing natives, plants from seed, I used moist heat for all of my seeds. When I tried to grow Joe Pie weed, I had no success. Since I had bought the seeds from Prairie Moon Nursery, I called for advice. They explained to me that Joe Pie weed needed cold stratification to prepare the seeds and sunlight to germinate. That's when I began to learn about the different germination requirements. Gardening is not about perfection. You'll try things, you'll make mistakes, and you'll lose some plants. But each time you learn to modify your technique, and move towards success. Feel free to try what works for you. I tried four new techniques this year. I switched from organic potting mix to organic seed starting mix, and it made a big difference in my rate of germination. Instead of keeping the pots on the heat until they germinated, I put them in the sun for the morning hours. Again, I saw an improvement. I added a flat aluminum roasting pan behind the flats of pots and was happy to see that my Seedlings did not grow leggy or reach towards the window. They grew straight and tall because they had plenty of sunlight. And I started watering by placing the pots in a tub of water for 10 minutes instead of watering the flat directly. The roots grew strong inside the pot and I didn't have problems with mold from overwatering. This year, I ended up with 65 pots of seedlings, a record for me. It took me all summer to find room for all these plants in my yard, but that's a great problem to have. You can purchase pots, seed trays, and labels, or you can creatively use what you have on hand. Use pots from previously purchased plants or yogurt cups and recycled cups if you cut holes in the bottom. I like salad green containers. They're the perfect greenhouses. Remove the top label to allow the sun in. Any clear container with a clear lid that fits the pots and seals will work. You can use clean aluminum foil roasting pans for trays and to reflect the sunlight onto your seedlings. Cut labels from yogurt containers. They hold up better than popsicle sticks or tape. And be sure to reuse whatever you do purchase. Once you have a native plant garden, you can collect your own seeds to propagate the plants that you love and you want more of. I get most of my seeds from my own garden and I only order seed packets when I want to add a new variety of native plants. Here are some examples of seeds that are ready to harvest. I included the date in the picture so that you can get an idea of the timing. Choose the dried brown seed heads only. If you look at the purple coneflower in the corner, some of those seed heads are still yellow. They're not ready yet. It's just the brown ones. I buy small envelopes from the dollar store to keep my collected seeds. They dry out better than they would in Ziploc bags and you can label them with the plant type and the year. Different seeds will mature at different times, so keep an eye on your plants to look for dried seed heads starting in late summer. Be sure to collect your seeds on a dry day. If you collect them after a rain, they could mold and be unusable. Just tip the envelope under the seed head and shake or rub the seed heads to collect the seeds. If the seeds don't fall out like cone flowers, just cut the whole seed head and keep that. Before putting the seeds you collected in the pot, you'll need to separate the chaff from the seeds. Since seed size and shape can vary, it can sometimes be hard to determine what are the seeds and what can be discarded. You can Google a particular seed to see what it looks like so you can identify it from the rest of the material. Some seeds like blue stem goldenrod and ironweed are hard to separate. If you look at them, they have a little umbrella attached and I find it difficult to remove that and I wouldn't wanna damage the seeds. So I just plant them like that, that's fine. So here are some examples of some seeds that I've prepared already this year, blue stem goldenrod, 
purple coneflower, New York ironweed, um, smooth blue aster, wild bergamot, and yellow coneflower. This year, I'm going to add columbine and wild blue phlox to my garden, so I purchase seeds. I've had success with native seeds that I purchased from Prairie Moon Nursery and the Wild Seed Project. But I've since learned that it's best, if possible, to choose native seeds that are locally sourced. They have adapted to local conditions and evolved with the local pollinators. At this time, it's not easy to find locally sourced seeds. You can check with these Long Island providers, swap seeds with friends, or check if your library has any native seeds in their seed library. I welcome your suggestions too for other options to find locally sourced seeds. If you can't find locally sourced seeds, it's okay to purchase seeds from Prairie Moon Nursery or Wild Seed Project. Hopefully in the future, locally sourced seed will be more readily available. So now this is just a picture of what I typically use my potting supplies. We have the organic seed starting mix, dollar store spray bottle. That's a salad green container with the small pots inside some seeds, some sand, but it has to be sandbox sand. You can't take beach sand and some homemade labels. So this process is the same regardless of the germination requirements. So you're always gonna start with these steps. I'm gonna go through the steps here and then I have further slides with pictures that I can go into more detail. I use the two and a half inch pots filled with damp organic seed starting mix add enough water to get the consistency of brownie mix. Plastic pots hold moisture best. Sprinkle the seeds on top generously. You can always divide the plants later. Sprinkle some clean sand like you'd use in a sandbox on top. Tiny, for tiny seeds, sprinkle lightly like you're seasoning your food and more heavily to cover the larger seeds. You want some light to get through, but you want the seeds to be kept moist by the sand and don't use beach sand. Give a few sprays with the water bottle to dampen the sand. Label the pots so you don't forget what's in there and place the pots in a sealed container. Like I said, I like to use the plastic containers that salad greens come in. Be sure to remove the top label because you need sun. Any clear container with a clear lid that seals will work to keep the pots moist. Here we have the pots in the container. This is some seed starting mix with enough water so it looks like you're making brownies. <laughs> and then you fill in the pots, but don't fill them all the way up to the top because you don't want the seeds to wash away when you spray them. And then here we have two, the top row is aster seeds and the bottom row is wild bergamot. Aster seeds are a little bigger, so we put more sand. But once you hit the water, you see, uh, you can still see the seeds through there, but they'll be held in place and kept moist this way. And the wild bergamot are tiny seeds, so they take much less sand and again, hit them up. And you wanna label them and put them in the container. You can do all one type of seed or you can mix it up, but if you mix it up, make sure they have the same germination requirements because the container is going to the same place. So the next step, Oh, and the second picture has the cover on. The next step depends on the germination requirements of the seeds you're growing. Again, group your pots by germination requirements. So cold stratification. A lot of native perennials require cold stratification. This prevents seeds from germinating at the wrong time of year for survival. You're basically mimicking winter by placing the containers in your fridge. If your selected seed doesn't require cold stratification, you can skip this step. If you're not sure of the requirements of your seed, it doesn't hurt to cold stratify. The seeds must be kept cold and moist, but not so wet that they mold. If you see black fuzz or white fuzz on top of the soil, your pots are too wet. Prepare the pots as specified above. Be sure to place them in the container before putting them in the fridge. Make a note of the date so you know when to remove the pots from the fridge. Check every three days to make sure the soil is still damp. Just touch it with your finger and you should be able to tell. And if not, water sparingly with the spray bottle. Cold stratification is needed to help the seeds break dormancy. Most likely your seeds won't sprout during this step. If you're growing several types of native perennials that have different cold stratification time, you might want to change to uh, the 30 day pots later. Here's my typical timing. 
I cannot see my whole screen here. Okay, third week of January, start 60, the 60 day cold stratification pots and move them to sun and moist heat the third week of March. In the third week of February, I start my 30 days cold stratification pots and move them to sun and moist heat third, day in, third week in March. And from in mid-March, we start the pots that don't require cold stratification with just sun and moist heat. You can start additional pots at any time, I think, the previous one of the previous slide had a picture of a uh, um, little blue stem that I had started, and I think I started that in May because it comes up pretty quickly. Once the seeds have cold stratified, or after potting, if no cold stratification is needed, I use my low tech method for simulating morning sun and afternoon shade using a south facing windowsill and a radiator. If you don't have a south facing window and a generous size radiator like I do, you might need grow lights and heat mats, but I haven't had to use either one of these techniques. Place the container, still with the clear cover in place, on the windowsill at 8 a.m. Around 1 p.m., move out of the sun and onto the radiator for the rest of the day and night. Don't leave the container in the sun all day. It could overheat and cook the seeds. This process of warmth and light will work for most native seeds. Check the containers every other day to make sure the pots are damp and water as needed with the spray bottle. Native seeds take a long time to germinate. It's expected. Don't be discouraged. Just keep following the steps. The resultant plants will live in your yard for years and years and self-seed. It's worth the wait. For example, this year I started Old Field Goldenrod, 60-day cold stratification on February 2nd, moved it to sun and heat April 4th, and had tons of sprouts by April 11th. Once the, spot, the pot sprout, which could take days or weeks, depending on the native plant you're growing, remove the cover. Just leave them in the sun from here on out. And once they have leaves, don't top water. Fill a separate container with water and sit the pots in for 10 minutes every other day. In the past, when I directly watered the bottom of the containers, I had trouble with mold and the seedlings would grow long roots out of the bottom of the pot. When the sprouts have grown to about an inch, you can move them to a regular fl plastic flat on the windowsill. I add a flat aluminum foil baking tray to the back of the flat to balance the sunlight back at the plants. Before I started doing this, my seedlings would lean towards the window and get very leggy looking for light, and I would have to keep turning the pots. When the seedlings get too crowded or are getting too large, split the bunches of seedlings into two, three, or four clumps and move them to a three inch or larger separate pots. Switch to moist organic potting mix this, at this time. Seed starting mix doesn't have the nutrients for optimum growth. Keep the soil around the roots to limit the root damage when you pull the chunks apart. Dig a hole in the center of the pot, potting mix and gently place the single clump in each pot. Surround with more potting mix. Continue watering every other day by setting into a container of water for 10 minutes. Once your seedlings are beginning to look like miniature versions of the plants you're trying to grow with true leaves and starting to reach a bit, it's time to think about moving your plants outside. I do this in batches, starting with the largest, healthiest pots of seedlings. This will give the other seedlings time to catch up, but don't attempt hardening off before mid-May. One year I started in April and it hailed and I lost a lot of seedlings. Indoor seedlings are pampered compared to outdoor plants and need to be outside for increasing amounts of time. Oh, sorry, and <laughs> need to be hardened off in order to survive outside. This requires a week of moving them outside for increasing amounts of time. Hardening off will help the plants adjust to sun, wind, rain, and temperature changes. The process can be tedious, but well worth the results. Start with an hour the first day and increase an hour each day, splitting the time between sun and shade at first. Beware of windy or unseasonably cold days. Both can desiccate new seedlings. They can also get sunburn if you put them in direct sun too long, too soon. Temperatures should be at least 50 degrees and the wind should be mild. Skip any day the weather is not mild enough. Better to plant healthy seedlings a little later. Also, Put them on a table or bench to keep the rabbits and the slugs from getting them. 
And don't forget to water your outside pots as needed and plant as soon as you can. After a week of gently exposing your plants to the elements, they'll be ready to grow outside. Be sure to plant the new plant in the right location for the needed growing conditions. You can find this information on prairiemoon.com, growwithbuildit.com, or on the seed packets that you purchased. Pay attention to sun exposure, soil moisture, and height. For sun exposure, full sun requires six or more hours of sun during the growing season. Partial sun needs three to six hours of direct sunlight. Shade requires less than three hours of sunlight. For soil moisture, wet soil is soggy or marshy most of the year. Medium wet soil is excessively wet in the winter and spring after heavy rain, but often dries in the summer. Medium dry soil is well drained. Water, uh, yes, and dry soil is excessively drained. My soil is clay, so I have medium wet soil that can be like concrete in the summer. I add lots of compost when I plant my seedlings. You should also be aware of the mature height of your plants so that you can put tall plants in the back of the garden and the shorter plants in the front. I've been, I've made this mistake. Bloom time is another important factor. Try to add plants that bloom at all different times. You want spring bloomers, summer bloomers, and fall bloomers. Wild geranium and golden alexander are spring bloomers. Most popular natives are summer bloomers and goldenrod and aster will bloom in the fall. Some native plants are aggressive seeders. They're helpful to fill in difficult areas and also very helpful to wildlife. These aggressive seeders like black-eyed Susan and mist flower will need to be thinned each year to keep them from crowding out your other plants. But it's well worth the trouble. Black-eyed Susan is the host plant to the silvery checker spot and mist flower is a host plant to lots of moth species. Gardening is not about perfection. You try things and you learn. If you discover later that you've chosen the wrong location for your and your plant is struggling, I believe it's worth a try to relocate it. You may lose the plant by moving it or it may thrive in the new location. Wet the soil well and dig carefully around the roots. Follow my planting guidelines to safely relocate. Water it regularly until it reestablishes. Don't panic if it wilts. That's a defense mechanism to keep all the energy in the roots. When you're ready to put your plants in the ground, choose a cloudy or cooler day, water pots well, dig a, the hole bigger than the pot. I have clay soil, so I mix compost in my hole. If you have fertile, fertile well-drained soil, you may not need compost. Put some water in the hole, remove the plant gently from the pot and loosen the soil at the bottom to allow the roots to spread out. When placing a plant in the hole, Make sure the soil level is the same as the pot soil level. Fill in with a mix of soil and compost if needed and press down around the plant and water frequently. The first year, your seedlings may still be small. The next year, they'll grow considerably and the third year, they'll really take off. I know once you get results, you'll love growing from seed as much as I do. All native plants will send out seeds into your yard. The added bonus of growing from seeds is that you'll recognize any seedlings that pop up and you can move these new free plants wherever you want. Plants grow from seed are also have the advantage of being more genetically diverse. A lot of plants that you can buy are grown from cuttings, which are clones of the parent. Each seed is genetically unique. I saw this in my garden when I grew native hibiscus from seeds. I collected from a plant with pink flowers. Some of the new plants had white, pale pink, or even red flowers. You can enjoy your garden all spring, summer, and fall, joining Bling Biodiversity Long Island, a local citizen science project through iNaturalist. They're, they are collecting data from native gardeners to document what wildlife is thriving in your garden. Just take a picture of the animal or insect that you encounter in your garden and upload it to Bling project on iNaturalist. It will be reviewed and verified and will become part of the data set. It's fun and it's easy. I walk my garden in search of wildlife every day anyway. You can see here that I made 118 observations from May to November this year. It's rewarding to know that I made, I made a difference. So now you know how to learn about growing and germinating conditions of the plants you wanna grow. 
how to prepare seeds and pots for germination, providing germination environment, caring for your seedlings, getting them ready for life outside, and planting them for the best chance of success. Feel free to try modifications to these methods if they work better for you. Remember, gardening is not about perfection. It's about learning and creating a wonderful habitat for you and your family and the wildlife that will surely show up to appreciate your effort. And I'm going to leave you with a slide of my favorite books. I'm always looking for more information on this. At this time, I welcome your questions and any suggestions for seed starting techniques that have worked for you. I'm always looking to improve my process. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. We do have a few questions. Oh, so great. I'm going to, yes, questions are good. I'm going to um, just verbalize them for you so you can address. Can you use rice holes instead of sand? I don't know. I haven't tried that. Would it be too big for some case of this? I don't this know. I, the, I got the idea from of the sand from the uh, Wild Seed Project article. So um, I haven't heard rice hill, holes. But I know that some people do the cold stratification in sand instead of in soil, which I tried, but then you have to pick out the individual little seedlings. <laughs> it's not easy to do. You have to find them first off and then you have to pick them out and put them in a pot. Try, yes. it. Try some Try. sand and some rice hulls and see what works. And I'd love to know the answer. Yes. So if um, can you readdress again, what's the purpose of the sand and why it is needed? Um, it's to keep the seeds in place when you water them. And also to, because you don't want to bury the seeds. Most seeds, if they need a little sunlight, you don't want to bury them. So if you just sprinkle the sand, the sand will hold them in place and keep them moist. That's but great. I know I've, I've seen articles where they don't use the sand, but it works for me. Okay. And you've been doing this for 15 years. <laughs> we trust your judgment. <laughs> um, you. <laughs> is cold stratification all, only for seed gathered from the garden or is that needed for seeds that purchase? Also? Um, I do it with the purchased ones too. I think they keep them cold. The thing is, even if they keep them cold, they're not keeping them moist. They're not going to be moist until we make them moist. So I think, I think you need to still put them in the fridge. I mean, I, I they could call the seed provider and see what they say. Yes, I think it it should be on the seed packet if you look at it and if they say it's been stratified or not. So, um, yes, check with the seed provider. Yeah, check with them. Um, there, there is a question about um, what is the difference between this method and the using of plastic milk jug and put those outside? You said you tried both. Um, yeah, I didn't have I didn't have a lot of luck with the um, the thing with the milk cartons. Is you have to put them in the right location. So you know, I'm not sure exactly if they need sun or they don't need sun. I'm not sure when to water them, when to not water them. And I also had problems with slugs. So I had put um, coffee coffee filters in the bottom of my jugs, and I still had the the um, slugs come in. So I only tried it one year, I have to say. I kind of prefer to be hands-on. So I like to keep an eye on my, you know, I like gardening in the winter. So I like to have to check my little containers every three days and all that, I, I enjoy that. And it's really, it doesn't take that much time, you know, because, you know, it takes like 15 minutes every couple of days, but I, I just enjoy that. So I didn't feel like I had enough control with that. <laughs> with the milk jugs but a lot of people love that method and they get so many plants from it it just didn't work for me okay there's one about bling um yes bling is a group that you can join if you have eye naturalists we have a webinar on it actually so i will put that link on there but I um I, if it, i went to a previous webinar and that's why i started doing it i love it I, yes. I walk around my garden every day looking for critters anyway. So I love that I can take a picture and send it to the data set. Mm -hmm.